Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome. Welcome back. We did have a week off uh, last week in honor of our Independence Day celebration. So thank you again for joining us here on Friday, July 10th for our California Nevada chat and update. Uh, at, at the start, I would like to just take a moment uh, to acknowledge the loss of PGA professional Sean Fredrickson uh, and uh, the current president of the Pacific Northwest section and uh, unfortunately his children as well in a tragic air tragedy over Coeur d'Alene. So uh, please keep the Fredrickson uh, family in mind and our colleagues in the Pacific Northwest uh, tragedy, this great loss this, this past weekend. And so again, uh, thanks to our colleagues in Southern California, Mr. Tom Addis, Nikki Gatch, Bryce Seaver, and, uh, and our own Caitlin Doyle and team here in Northern Cal that keeps us going. We have our speakers today, uh, Dr. Thomas Riley, uh, Jeff Price, a commercial officer of the PGA of America, uh, Craig Kessler, director of government affairs and Southern California Golf Association, and Kevin Fitzgerald, the assistant director of government affairs in the SCGA. You know, there's been there's been a lot of news. Numbers are up as you know, poking around and doing some research uh, in Nevada. We see where Governor Sisolak has ordered ordered the bars closing. Uh, today, returning to phase one, uh, restaurants going to six or six or less people, encouraging outside dining and more county information to be released today. Uh, same in the state of California and uh, in the Bay Area, and Craig can speak in detail about Southern California. In the state, we have now 300,000 cases, just under 300,000 cases of COVID-19 confirmed. And counties moving on uh, the watch list and the indoor dining and bars are re-emerging in terms of closing those. So we've not gone backwards as an industry. We're grateful for that. But uh, there are there is a lot of motion going on, a lot of caution going on. And in many counties, if not the state, the recommendation to wear face coverings when in public or in a position where public might be. And, and an example of that might be our you know, our office in Vacaville, it's a small office, but we do have our face coverings because though we rarely get have someone come visit, there is that possibility. So we want to uh, we want to be prepared for that. And as our, our uh, um, uh, advocate in Sacramento, Tony Rice, said on a call this morning, uh, things at the legislature are pretty much a mess. So that's that's the current news. We'll get into more detail as we go. So let's get our, our program started, and I'd like to have some words by our Northern California PGA Section President, uh, Didi Moriarty. Didi? No, thanks, Len. Um, Tom, good to see you. Jeff, thanks for being here. Craig, always, thank you for the job you do, and certainly welcome to Dr. Rice. Basically, just the opportunity to say hello. It's funny, I was thinking about it this morning, two weeks ago. Things seemed to be trending in the right direction, and now we're just going to have to be ever more vigilant to uh, to write the ship, so to speak. So um, thank you, everybody, uh, just for the opportunity to say hello. And I'll throw it back to Tom and Len. Thanks, Dee Dee, and, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, it's nice to be here again after a week, and we're going to uh, uh, keep these going uh, once a week. We may drop down to every other week, but right now with uh, enough going on that we feel it's important to continue these uh, chats uh, every Friday. So, uh, and hopefully we don't have to go back to doing them twice a week like we did uh, at the start and, and that everybody keeps working. Um, as Len mentioned, there's a lot of stuff going on out there and, and uh, uh, we need to be very, very aware. Uh, we need to keep up our responsibilities. As a matter of fact, that's been a key word uh, on many occasion is being responsible. And now, as we move along with our with our game, uh, as you know, it was approved as an outdoor activity in California, golf was or is. And uh, I encourage you, um, I know sometimes, uh, and I know that more and more tournaments are are coming on or events are coming on, I'm going to encourage you to use the word activity uh, whenever you can. Uh, we have a, a PGA member activity or we have a junior golf activity, uh, thinking that that might be more responsible than using the word tournament or even in some cases events, because uh, that might tend to lean towards 
uh, the terminology it might tend to lean towards uh, gatherings, and we don't want to do that. It's all that we've talked about the optics uh, over and over and over again. So I'm just throwing that that uh, new word at you uh, once again, uh, and uh, once again throwing a new word at you, and that's using the word activity as much as you can. And, and you'll see that in our the Southern California PGA um, uh, notices and. Uh, uh, socials and all the like. So, but you've got to be careful out there. Wear the face coverings, uh, the distance, uh, and, and we'll hear that later on from the good doctor. The distance is so critical. Uh, keeping your hands clean, keeping your hands away from your face, uh, that's critical to staying healthy. So, um, thank you for all of that. Uh, now, I'd like to introduce our section president um, from Dove Canyon Golf Club, Mr. Tony Latendre. Tony? Good morning, everyone. And just uh, I think everybody's pretty well said it all. And so I won't take a, a lot of time, but just to reiterate, just to thank you for everybody for being on the call. And Jeff, thanks for taking the time to be with us this morning and giving us an update as to what's going on. And uh, Didi, always nice to hear you. Len, Tom, great to see everybody. And uh, can't wait to hear what's new in uh, the last couple of weeks, other than what we've heard on the news. So thanks so much. Thanks, Tony. Uh, and just to echo Len, just thanks to everybody again, Jeff, for being here, Dr. Riley, Craig, uh, Tony, Dee Dee, uh, Nikki, Bryce, Caitlin, thank you so much for your support and help. Uh, and Len, thank you. And uh, Len and I have the great opportunity to talk with each other probably two to three to four times a day. And um, it's an absolute pleasure uh, and look forward to every day. So Len, thanks for all you do. And let's have a good one. Well, uh, this is this is teamwork all the way, Tom. Thank you. So, uh, Jeff, I'd love to turn it over to you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the uh, Chief Commercial Officer for the PGA of America, Mr. Jeff Price. And Jeff, you've been you've been with us through this whole journey. So much appreciated for the incredible work that you've done. And and today, I believe you're going to talk to us about the PPC and the thoughts and decision making there, and certainly the Ryder Cup as well. So, thank you, Jeff. Certainly, Len, and uh, look forward to being in San Francisco in just about a month uh, for the PGA Championship, which uh, is still on schedule. And uh, we're working feverishly to make sure that the health and, and wellness of everyone involved is, is of top priority and working closely with the city of San Francisco, state of California, all of the medical officials to, to make sure that we can operate uh, our great major championship in a responsible way. And so look forward to, to see, hopefully seeing you uh, in a month but um, unfortunately, we had to make the decision regarding uh, the PGA Professional Championship that was to be played in Austin later this month uh, to cancel that for 2020. Um, we, we waited till literally the last possible moment to try to play the event. Um, but really, there were two significant factors that uh, weighed in. Um, in working with the CDC and the scientists to stop COVID, who've been incredibly helpful uh, both of those organizations to us in, in really understanding uh, what metrics to be looking at. Um, one of the key metrics is hospitalizations and ICU units. And unfortunately, in Texas and certainly in Austin, um, that the surge of on the healthcare professionals has been significant. And so from a, a standpoint of making a responsible decision, trying to bring over 300 people to Austin uh, and potentially, you know, create additional uh, taxing of that medical system in uh, in Austin. And then with the quarantines that have gone in place in, in various states across the country to ask PGA professionals to potentially be away from work for 14 days uh, was really just too much of an ask as well. And so when you take the, the situation in Texas, and the, the, the certainly the capacity from a medical Medicare uh, medical care standpoint, and the the push that it would have created in terms of potentially having members 14 days away from their jobs, it just the only uh, responsible decision was unfortunately to cancel the PPC. So uh, in this year, we will be using the 2019 uh, points list, uh, and those 20 PGA professionals will be represented in the field, and we're we're very excited. Um, this year to have ESPN put uh, significantly more focus, and you'll see uh, quite a bit of walk-up promotion on SportsCenter 
and otherwise uh, featuring the 20 professionals and the roles that they play as PGA professionals in the golf industry and telling those stories, which we think are so important. So we will have 20 PGA professionals in the field. It'll come off the points list. And as I said earlier, we're, we're very excited uh, to play without fans, but to bring major championship golf to California and specifically lend to, uh, to the Bay Area at Harding Park. So that's the update on the PPC. Um, I'm sure most of you read the postponement of the 2020 Ryder Cup until 2021. Um, that process was incredibly complicated. Um, obviously, it, it required the PGA Tour to work with us, which they were terrific partners, and um, move the President's Cup into 22 to allow for the Ryder Cup to be played in 21. We worked with our partners at Kohler um, to make sure that from a, a Whistling Straits and a Kohler destination perspective, they were on board with the, with the postponement, and they've been great partners as well. And then working with Ryder Cup Europe, um, as I think many of you know, the Ryder Cup is the significant um, you know, monetary asset for both our organization and their organization. And they'll now have to wait another year until 23 to get the Ryder Cup uh, in Italy uh, and, and the revenue that's associated with that for Ryder Cup Europe. But we all came together. I think in general, the golf industry has behaved incredibly well, obviously at the grassroots level, all the work that, that is being done to take advantage of, of the outdoor recreation opportunity that golf offers and seeing uh, you know full tee sheets and all the activity that you all are, are helping to drive. But on the professional level, to see the organizations come together, um, rework the schedule, and now ultimately rework additional schedules in 21 and 22 and beyond to see the Ryder Cup played next year. Um, Seth, I think, made a great analogy. He talked to Mark Murphy from the Packers to try and gauge what the Packers are planning to do in September. And they're contemplating potentially bringing maybe 25 or 30% of their fans in the Lambeau field. And, and when Seth was talking to Mark, he said, our problem is we have to build Lambeau field at Whistling Straits starting in June. And, and given that uncertainty, um, there was no desire to play the Ryder Cup without fans. The fans are such an important part of that event that um, it really the responsible thing to use uh, to use Tom's words, uh, was to move it to 21. And it took us probably 45 days to get there in terms of all the moving pieces. Um, but we're very hopeful that uh, by pushing it back 15 months, we will be able to bring the Ryder Cup in its full glory, uh, the 2020 Ryder Cup being played in 21 at Whistling Straits. And so th those are the updates. Uh, I think it's uh, a great thing for golf that we were able to work this out. And, uh, and move the Ryder Cup and then the President's Cup. And then we will stay in the odd years going forward. So uh, essentially after 9-11, it moved to the even years given that postponement. We're now moving back to the odd years beginning in 21. So Tom Len, that's a quick update from our end. Happy to answer any questions that, uh, that folks may have. Okay, thank you, Jeff. And, and again, for everybody that had to work through that you know, even on a very simple scale here, when we talk about, as Tom mentioned, activities and such, it gets complicated pretty quickly. And when we're on the world stage with things such as tour events and the Ryder Cup uh, and the President's Cup and the PPC, it gets even even incredibly complex. So thanks for getting all that worked out. And again, our theme has been common. It's all about the safety of the people involved, about the players and the volunteers. And as Seth mentioned earlier on, let's be good partners. Let's be good partners with our partners. And I think that the, the industry has proven that that's how we've acted all along. So um, very good, Jeff, thanks. I hope you can stay with us uh, for, the, for the remainder of the chat. And um, okay, question will come in. Uh, Jeff, any news on the, on the Solheim Cup? That great question. Uh, obviously, another really important event, uh, team event in golf. Um, we are working with Mike Wan and the LPGA to make sure that the Solheim Cup, um, it, which right now is scheduled to be played three weeks prior to the Ryder Cup, gets all the attention and focus that it deserves. Um, Mike has been, uh, you know, both the PGA and, and LPGA tours have, have really collaborated with us um, effectively, you know, for many years, but certainly in these last few months, uh, the cooperation has been tremendous. And, you know, Seth and Mike have, have been talking almost daily and we, the, the Solheim Club, as of now, is still scheduled for Inverness 
uh, over Labor Day weekend of 21. Um, and we look to support them uh, with that uh, in as, as much as we possibly can to make sure that that event doesn't kind of lose any, any muster because of the Ryder Cup coming closely off its heels. But uh, again, I think Mike has been a terrific partner and we will do all that we can to, to elevate that event as well. Thank you, Jeff. And, and uh, an, another point of pride for here in, in California and in Northern California, we're grateful to have our PJ section member, Pat Hurst, as the captain for the 2021 uh, Solheim Cup team. That, that's just terrific. So, so, Jeff, thank you. And as I said, I hope you're able to uh, join us and stay with us for the remainder of the of this. Time. I will be, Len. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, so, ladies and gentlemen, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Thomas Riley. Uh, Dr. Riley was born and raised uh, in Pasadena and is double board certified in internal medicine uh, from USC. And he's received his em emergency room training at UCLA and is a diplomat of the American College of Emergency Physicians, which is the highest achievement. Uh, Dr. Riley currently practices at Pomona Valley Medical Center and the San Bernardino Hospitals and established the first stroke clinic in Bakersfield, uh, in, in essence, between Los Angeles and San Francisco as a sought after speaker, certain locally and nationally. And, and particular thanks, Dr. Riley, for our conversation last night. And I know you're you're great, uh, uh, thankful enough to join us after a 12 hour shift. So uh, we, we look forward to hearing from you uh, about COVID-19 and help us understand more about why we do what we're doing and, and the things we can continue to do to keep ourselves and, and our, our constituents safe. So ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Thomas Riley. Okay, maybe not. All right. Oh, I think he's back on. Are you, can you hear me? Can you there hear me? Go. There we you go. Okay. Riley, yes. Yeah. Okay. All right. We're on. Okay. Well, it's, it's great to be here. Good morning. Um, uh, it's fantastic to hear us talk about the Ryder Cup, the President's Cup, uh, forthcoming um, outings uh, for golf. Uh, and, you know, who would have ever thought that we'd be using the term, quote, social distancing um, uh, just a few months ago? So, you know, the world has changed and we're going to try to normalize it but this is a this is a one in 100 years pandemic uh, uh the skies have opened up with a virus that's invisible it's relentless uh we're navigating through it uh and uh i think that the pga has taken the lead and in really putting some some parameters out there that are going to make it safe for us to continue to play golf and golf being a non-contact sport um we're rolling out a situation where we should be leading uh when you look at baseball football and the other sports golf is a, is 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 great for for showing how it's done for social distancing and for setting parameters that are going that are going to ensure that the members and the junior pda play safe so let me just quickly go go about this virus and and um, um, I'm on the front lines. Uh, we knew this was coming, and uh, initially we thought, okay, well this is a virus. Is this going to be a flu? The flu um, is this going to be similar to that? Oh, it is much more. It's much more infectious. Uh, it is. I mean, if you cough one time and you're close to that cough, you're going to get the virus. Um, it is, this, this is the problem with this virus. It is so infectious, much more infectious than the flu. All right, in April, our deaths peaked out. Um, if you remember in New York two months ago, uh, New York was dripping wet with COVID. Um, we went from Wuhan, China, and uh, at that time, a lot of industry in Milan, Italy, and um, uh, the airlines took the virus literally into Italy, across to Spain. New York got hit very hard, 
And the way New York is getting hit, we are currently in California getting hit. Um, it is COVID dripping wet. It is infectious. Uh, we have to be careful. Uh, we always like to say, well, we can't, this is, really doesn't occur in kids. Well, not so fast. Um, we want to, of course, keep our players safe. Um, age 12, age 14 and under, we really haven't seen a case. Uh, my colleagues, I actually spoke to them last night. And um, we have, you know, we've seen a few cases above age 14 through 18. They do exist. For the younger kids, thank God we have something in place. And this is called, this is called T-cell immunity. What occurs in kids is that they have, we have different coronaviruses. This is caused by COVID-19, all right? But there are many coronaviruses that, that children have in their respiratory flora, and it is protected for them. And so their T cells remember what a coronavirus looks like. And that also, and that also provides immunity. It's called T cell immunity for COVID-19. Um, so you don't see kids, younger kids getting this. Uh, thank God. Uh, now, as we get older in the age group from 14 to 18, we have seen occasional cases. Think the mortality rate approaches zero in this age group but um uh so it's multi it's multifactorial when we when we roll out a golf event we're going to have all different ages present we've got the players we have the parents we have to uh, we have to account for the social distancing uh what i've seen on the, on the tournaments i've been to this year um uh it has been a lot of a lot of uh, a lot of a lot of um, protocols have been in place. You take a look. It was great to be able to come up to the to the window uh, to get balls, and the balls were already outside on the driveway. And that there's social distancing between any ATM type situation. Um, on the first tee, the kids are wearing are wearing their masks. That's fantastic. When I saw that, that's great. I'm worried more about the parents on the first hole, getting together, excited about their son or daughter uh, teeing off. And sometimes you notice they are too close. Uh, I think people are wearing masks. Masks, we've got to do that. It doesn't hurt. It doesn't hurt. It's going to help. Someone accidentally just coughs. You've got your mask on. That, that's going to keep you from getting the virus. Um, so uh, the parents before and after an event, We've got to worry about the parents. We have to keep them socially distanced. You gotta get excited about there out there. There's another issue too, and is as efficient as we are uh, with golfers teeing off, playing their nine holes, wrapping up, uh, uh, we have to take a look at what's going on at each golf course. Some golf courses have have um, uh, snack bars or little restaurants, makeshift restaurants. Uh, we have to make sure that those entities that are interacting with these players are having something to eat, make sure that 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 short order cook is wearing gloves, has got a mask on, and that in that area where people are eating a hot dog, that they're not just all in one table, not social, not social distancing. So so even peripherally, we have to be very careful. Uh, I have loved what I've seen so far. And so here we are in July. We have a pandemic. We have more cases in California, Nevada, and Arizona than we've ever had. All right, so we have a month here where we have to really be socially distancing. Um, um, you know, um, uh, the phase one of the virus, the viral load is out of control. There are too many cases. So how do we go forward? We have to socially distance, we have to keep our masks on, we have to be we have to be really judicious about this. We have to hope that the virus, um, you know, is, is as more and more people are exposed to the virus. All right, the virus. Once you're exposed to the virus, your body will develop antibodies. That should confer immunity. Some of us have had this and don't even know it. And if we went and had our blood our blood taken, we would we would have an antibody. It's called IgG antibody. The immune system is, is, that means the immune system has seen this and generated proteins. 
and that is that's that is protected. If we remember in March and early April when our death rate was really high, the chest X-rays we see in the emergency department were unbelievable. They were horrid looking. We hadn't seen anything like this. They're just wedges of lung tissue destroyed. What happened initially is, and with a spike in death initially, is this our immune systems had not seen this virus before. And so the immune system had a violent response to it. When the virus is attached to our, our lung unit called the alveolar cell, uh, the immune system goes after the virus, but collateral damage is the cells, the lung cells themselves are destroyed. It was called the cytokine and violent reaction. All right, that caused respiratory failure, that caused people to be on ventilators, um, and uh, initially people being on ventilators, there'd be a 70, 80% mortality rate, and we lost a lot of people. We know now that the immune system, the virus is so prevalent that our immune systems don't, don't just consider it as foreign now, that there is some exposure to it across you know, millions of people. Now our, 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 and with the use of steroids and our immune system making the adjustment, uh, it's not as violent a response. Lung tissue is being preserved and our death rate is going down. Okay, now this month, we may have a stay on that. We've had so many new cases. We may have a bump in deaths. And then as we move forward, I think we're gonna start to do well. Okay, and doing well, we, we've got to social distance. We've gotta be smart about this. We're in phase one. Now, we're gonna to continue to have these cases. It's just gonna be, we have to learn how to live in society. We can't close down forever with this virus. The people who have underlying conditions, if you're on chemotherapy, um, if you've got a bone marrow transplant, if you're diabetic, if you are on dialysis, you know, you need to not take any chances. Um, I'm sure you can be outdoors. You can't be around people. What about, I love about golf, golf being outdoors. The virus probably doesn't do as well outdoors. This this virus, okay, this pandemic, I think, is made, it's made for golf. <laughs> okay, as I say, we were able to we were able to do this carefully, and I like what I've seen so far. As we go towards the fall, um, uh, we're gonna still have that viral load. It's not going away. Phase two will come in November, and you know that a lot of universities are trying to start their, their school year early, and by November, well, you're gonna have virus all the way through November, then we're gonna have a flu system. That's going to make us vulnerable with the flu season coming in, excuse me, flu season. And we're, we're going to, that's gonna be a vehicle for this virus uh, phase two of the pandemic to get out of control. Now, what will happen is I think our immune systems are becoming acclimated. So, you know, you're under 70 and you're in good health. You're gonna get it, take two weeks, get over it, you're gonna be fine. If enough people get this, we're going to develop what is called herd immunity. Herd immunity is where so many people have it and they have conferred immunity and they have that antibody that I talked about um, where there are going to be few, they're going to be fewer and fewer safe harbors uh, for the virus to replicate as we go forward. And eventually the virus will just burn itself out. Um, that's probably, hopefully that's going to be this spring and this may even occur. Herd immunity may occur even before we have a reliable vaccine. But if I can give you an idea of what has occurred in the emergency department, um, uh, it is one thing, okay? I can't breathe. I can't breathe. We had, it hit home for me uh, in late March when I was on a shift. Uh, this was at San Bernardino. And our nurse who was off, one of our nurses, a really good nurses was off. She walked in the ER. She said, something's wrong. I cannot breathe. And we we check we put that chest X-ray up there. It's like billowing, billowing clouds of 911 over your lung fields. And we're like, oh my God, how are we going to approach this? What are we going to do here? You know, we started with hydroxychloroquine. Uh, now we've started using steroids. Um, steroids sometimes shut down the immune system. And if you're diabetic, you can become septic and worse. We had to just play games with this thing. You know, do we intubate early? A lot of times people would stay on that, that ventilator and not get up. So we had to make a score of decisions and we're finding a way to get the death rate down. Now with rindesivir, which is a drug put out by Gilead, it's an antiviral, and by using decadron and sogamadrol, it's a steroid. That's just, if, you've, if anyone's ever had asthma, it'll relax your lungs. We relax our lungs, 
um, with that with hydroxychloroquine. You know, it's a potent anti-inflammatory. It's an anti-malarial. People take this all the time when they go to endemic countries for for malaria and they don't have any side effects to it. So, so the word on that, you know, I, I don't think enough studies have been done. So we've tried a lot. Basically, at the end of the day, we all have to stay healthy, and our immune systems have to get over this. It is so easy to get this virus. We get it. It's not the end of the world. Um, but we also want our players to be aware and to know the signs and symptoms of this disease. All right. The first thing is, is you're going to lose your sense of smell. You know, you're not tasting right. All right. Then you're going to have a muscle ache and maybe you're going to have a cough and you're not going to feel right. And you're going to have a fever. It comes, it goes, you know, something is wrong. You know, let's know who has it. Everyone Everyone needs to be aggressive and take the high road. You can get tested at the Rose. Well, there are so many outlets for testing now. Everyone should have, if there are any symptoms with the parents or the, or, or, or the, the players, get tested. We want to know what we have. So that's one thing I, I can't um, emphasize enough. Um, and um, that's going to, you know, um, not safeguard uh, a lot of people. And um, eventually we're going. We're going to get through this as society. And I think the PGA can lead the way here and how we do it. So I'm very impressed what we have so far. We have something that, you know, uh, a few hundred years down the road, they're gonna look back and see how we did this because this is unprecedented. You know, of course you have to go back 100 years to the Spanish flu, but this virus is just out there. If you yawn, if you have someone next to you who has asthma and uses a nebulizer, then the virus has become from droplet form, has now taken on this aerosolized form. Um, it, is, it is so contagious. So, um, you know, wearing a mask is not just a feel good, um, you know, image statement. M wearing a mask may save your life, okay? Or at least may save you from a ho hospitalization. So I like what I've seen so far. We're going to get through this. I think the PGA can lead the way. This is a great sport for this invisible enemy. And um, um, I'm, I would be happy to take any questions. Uh, and um, we're going to play these tournaments. We're going to do it safely. And I think we're going to set an example. Does anyone have any questions about the virus? Dr. About, uh, and yeah. Uh, thank you so much for that, and and uh, also complimenting the industry on the steps that have been taken, and and yes. uh, there have been so many partners in developing the back to golf protocols in partnership with the CDC and our local health officials and authorities such as yourself. So thank you for that. A uh, couple things, uh, Dr. Riley, the yes. our 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 temperature checks uh, a valid indicator or a sign or or not yes, so yeah. much. You, you stole my thunder. I was in, you're, you're, you're thinking right along with me. Uh, temperatures or checks are fantastic because um, even, you know, a temperature of 99.8, the typical fever uh, classified as a fever to be able to bill in the emergency department for a fever, your temperature has to be 100.4. Well, if it's 99.8, still that's really not normal. Um, if we have a player, you know, who's got, who's got fever, um, man, Oh gosh! What we want to do is is um, uh, test. We want we want to test that player. Um, uh, so if you if any player, I think this should be you know put in the protocol somewhere. But this is a great point you make. Um, if we have a if you show up and you have a fever, um, boy, you're gonna have to shut it down for that day, and you're gonna have to go out and test. That would be the prudent thing to do. So we wear masks. We take temperatures. That is a good screening mechanism for anyone. You know, getting close. Um, now, is it just going to be the players, or how about the parents who are going to be on that first tee? You know, um, clapping and watching. You know, anyone. So, if if we can if we can um, uh, find a way to envelop taking temperature uh, on players and just anyone who wants to be in the area, that is very protective. Very protective. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It, all right, thank you. So is 99.8 and higher, is that the magic number? The magic number, if you wanted to be official, would be 100.4. For these purposes here, if, if your temperature is above 100, 
I would say close enough. It's abnormal. You're approaching a fever. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and with that, there's a very good chance, you know, what else is going to, what's the most common thing that's going to be causing a fever today? The COVID-19 virus. Okay. So I think you have to presume this patient needs to be quarantined, this person needs to be quarantined and tested before they come back out, show that they're negative. Mm -hmm. I think that's a really yeah. good screening weapon and um, you'll be surprised, you know? And even though they take it a step further, you know, we're rolling out football, baseball, basketball. I think, again, that the immune system is acclimating. You know, if we were gonna, if we had one basketball player or a baseball player, you know, ending up in the intensive care unit, God forbid, you know, that's, that's going to make everybody take a look, you know, and say, oh my gosh, are we really gonna do that? I think golf is so safe that that if we can do it so safely, it's such a non-contact sport that um, uh, we be as diligent in screening people as we can. Um, but we, you know, we're going to continue to play, and we can do it safely. Uh, temperature checks for as many as participants as possible is just prudent. It's very prudent, and I would recommend it. Mm -hmm. Um, um, you know, we have to look, I mean, the official fever is 100.4, that's official. All right. Um, and so it's debatable is where we set that bar at 100 at 99.8 or 100.4. Mm -hmm. Dr. Ryan, there was some PGA, just a follow up question, because I know we have had instances across the country where, um, folks didn't necessarily social distance in a golf environment and folks had the disease and, um, contact tracing has been something that uh, obviously has been talked about and just maybe sure. spend a couple of minutes if you could talking about if somebody does have finds out after an event or an activity that someone does have the disease kind of the right steps to take in terms of making sure that others aware of who interact with that individual and kind of how to how to think about after the fact if someone does test positive right that's a, that's a that's a great point tracing you know, if we can have if we can have a resource for those who realize, gosh, you know, I had the virus, I was out there. Um, um, if we have a resource on our website um, uh, to uh, report this, all right, and then um, it would it would come down to an interview. We're going to ask them, who are you with? We were around large crowds. When did you ever start having symptoms? Um, you know, have you traveled anywhere recently? Um, have you been exposed to any potentially sick contacts? All right, that's what contact tracing is about. Um, um, to have that resource on the PGA website or to make it, to make it, you know, really publicized to anyone that they need to report back to us if they've had symptoms or if they're positive. Um, oh, that's, that's a great, that'd be a great tool. And um, the interview will be, you know, you know, where have you been, you know, and who else do you know who's had the virus? Um, who else has had a fever? Um, were you around? Um, were you in a big group of people at a restaurant um, at some point? Were you, you know, um, all of those things are really important. And uh, contact tracing is going to be a big part of how we contain this virus. So that would be uh, well, well. Uh, received and with a lot of efficacy to have that resource uh, and also to to um, convey to people that you know gosh you know we're not calling you out but gosh if you you can do this confidentially if you've had the virus it's going to be confidential let us know we've got to have a you know a link or something all the branch out there to motivate people to uh, let us know if they've they've been infected and if they're positive. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Ray, thank you. We're going to uh, jump around a little bit in touch with the nature of the question, but certainly there's a there's a common cause. There are so many face coverings uh, out there, uh, Dr. Ray. What do you recommend? Some some are very simple and some more complex, and then everything in between. Yeah, well, um, in the emergency department, if, if we're able to social distance in the emergency department, you know what we have, we have what's called the N95, N95 mask, which, which is, um, uh, the seal is very tight around your mouth and your nose, 
Um, and uh, even in the emergency department, we don't wear that all the time. Only if we are unable to socially distance and we're, we're, we're in harm's way, like we're approaching a patient who's positive for COVID. Actually, in that situation, um, you can take a look at me. I would, uh, I'd actually look like an astronaut in a suit where I've got a helmet on and I have my own ventilation system that's pumped into it. And I'm, I'm completely, um, um, you know, there's an interface between me and I'm secure. Now, out on, the, out on the golf course, you don't need that N95. You just need that typical blue mask. And, and um, you just, it is crucial if you're around, you know, five, 10 people, and you, maybe you're lining up to watch someone tee off, we forget about that six foot rule, okay? And even, even more than that, if someone next to you coughs, all right, that, that virus becomes, trans, it, it transmits itself, um, and it, we're initially a droplet, a droplet tape of um, contact spread. Um, when you cough, okay, the air that comes out with that cough aerosolizes the virus. So let's take that six feet and take it up to 13 feet. Okay, so coughing is the biggest way this virus is spread. So, so you just want to have that mask on. Um, have it on, you know, snug, and it doesn't have to be an F fancy N95. Um, just as long as your nose and mouth are covered in a snug way, um, you know, hey, I've seen all types of masks. They all work. They're all, they're all looking good. As long as your nose and your mouth are covered, that's, that's where you're going. And if you do, you do, you do not want to get this virus, the way not to get this virus is don't touch your face. Don't touch your nose. Don't touch your mouth. Okay. Have some pearl on you all the time. And if for some reason you had to scratch your nose or something, you're going to do a cleaning of everything, of, of, of your fingers, the intertrigenous areas in between each finger, and you're going to do a really good cleaning. Um, uh, so that's how you don't get this virus. Uh, the mask doesn't have to be some fancy, you know, um, uh, uh, lock-on papper. It, it, it can just be the mask that we see out there. They're fine. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Hey. Dr. Riley, thank you. So I've got a couple other things and I, I would feel like they're related. Uh, one is the herd immunity and then, and then yes. of course, the, the prospect of, of a vaccine. So we are, yep. uh, you know, 40 million people here in California, counties like San Diego and Los Angeles, which are high, high density population counties, even San Francisco, right. And right. the Bay Area, six counties. And then we have Lassen County, Tulare County, where in some cases there are only there are only ten thousand people, maybe seven thousand people across That's quite a valley. quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. how do we define, uh, Dr. Riley? How do we define herd immunity? Is it a percentage of people given a population? You know, what 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 are the metrics there? Right. Well, I can tell you just when you talk about Tulare County, I've had very, very a lot of uh, experience from county just south of Tulare and just north of Los Angeles. To the north of us is Kern County. I can tell you right now that there are 500 kids in Kern County, they're teenagers, and they have this virus as we speak. So, you know, we're, you know, kids under 12, I think pretty protected, uh, under 14, you, you get 14 and above. And uh, uh, we're going, you know, this, this, this virus, this virus is prevalent. Um, so when you talk about herd immunity, now herd immunity is is technically um, herd immunity. We could we could give you a definition that herd immunity is ninety five percent of potentially infected people of of the population. Ninety five percent of the population has already been exposed to the virus. That is herd, herd immunity. What happens if 95% of the population have been exposed to the virus? Um, the virus has no safe harbor for which to replicate and multiply. Okay, And if enough people have been exposed to it and they have antibodies, that virus is not going to procure itself in people who already have antibodies. That's an IgG antibody and your body is immune to it. Um, it's, um, you know, it's, it's, 
it is it is the nature's way of supplying a vaccine where um uh, and let me just take this back to maybe november or december um last november december uh, we estimate that about 8,000 people a day were flying into either Seattle, Los Angeles, San Francisco uh, from, from uh, Asia. And um, a lot of them had the virus. And so we may have slowly gotten acclimated to it. And uh, in California, we weren't hit initially. And probably because that virus was slowly introduced to the immune system, the immune system didn't have that violent response the way the way new york had okay the deaths were unbelievable in new york city in california we were doing okay all right we've had time for the virus for our immune systems to adjust and so and so we're not seeing the death rates thank god in california and out west that they had in new york city now herd immunity some say listen if you don't have diabetes and you're not on chemotherapy or a bone marrow transplant recipient or on dialysis okay those those people with underlying conditions stay home everybody else go out get the virus get over it we've all gotten it we all have immunity now that that's that is by definition herd immunity where the virus has no more safe harbors uh, that's the idea and that's how without a vaccine that's how a pandemic ends that's how the spanish flu went from 1918 to 1920 and didn't continue on people had herd immunity even 100 years ago um, um, they knew that if you take the plasma of a recovered person and inject that into someone who was sick it would most likely have be efficacious and help that person survive all right so um, um, herd immunity is everyone everyone being exposed to the virus the virus has no place to go the virus burns itself out. Mm -hmm. Now, the other side of that is, well, we have an incredible pharmaceutical industry now and we're gonna generate a vaccine. It's gonna to be tough to generate a vaccine, which um, a vaccine is, is uh, where if you inject the virus, you initially inject it into animals, the animals produce a, a series of proteins in their immune system to fight this virus and survive. You take those proteins, the plasma, spin it down, isolate those proteins, um, um, and then you do the same in humans. And you identify the plasma proteins that provide you with a response to neutralize the virus. These are called neutralizing antibodies. Um, uh, and you package that, and then you give that to you know, the, the participants, you get into phase two and three. Um, you have to do trials with, you know, really thousands of people to make sure this is safe. So you're trying to generate the proteins in one um, injection called the vaccine that are gonna fight and eradicate and neutralize this virus. That's a vaccine. Now, part of the, part of the difficulty was, will be, will be viruses are really deceptive. Bacteria are easy to treat. We know you've got pneumonia. We're going to give you an antibiotic. Bacteria, they have cell walls. We have a target for it, the antibiotic. And, and, and we do great with bacteria. Viruses are very elusive, and they change forms. And so we may have what we think is a vaccine, and the virus is going to mutate out of that, out of the current form, change its protein nucleic acid makeup, and now the vaccine will be no, no longer be functional. If you take the flu vaccine, we have to get the flu vaccine every year because we're trying to match what the flu virus is doing. It's changing, so we have to change our vaccine. So I think it's my feeling that we will have eventually, we'll have a vaccine, but it's gonna take maybe five to 10 versions of a vaccine to find the one that's actually really effective. And that's gonna be well into next year. And by that time, we could already have herd immunity. So that's the approach. We're gonna have a difficult six months coming up here difficult we have so many cases mm -hmm. okay dr riley thank you and uh nikki i believe you have a question or two for dr riley yes thanks lynn uh, uh one he just addressed with the, the herd um herd immunity if we should be expediting that process um mm -hmm. anything that you wanted to add or do you feel that you covered that one um well sure <coughs> herd immunity uh 
is in itself by definition. You know, we can't tell people to we cannot tell people to go out and get the virus because um, uh, it's just going to happen passively. But if we did, and then these people go back and their elderly family members who have had a stroke or whatever are put at risk. So we got to be careful. You know, this isn't this isn't a vehicle to go out and get the virus because then our loved ones with underlying con uh, conditions are going to be vulnerable to all of us who are are going to be temporary carriers before our, our antibodies set in. And so we can give it to those who can do poorly. Right now, those who are doing poorly, usually over the age of 80. So we have to be, you know, smart about this. People with underlying conditions, you know, you're not going to be out there. You're, you're, you're going to be at home. You're going to be quarantined, you know. So we're going to have the brick and mortar before COVID approach, and then we're going to have the current COVID approach where we're not all at the office. Um, we like things like, uh, let's see, DocuSign and Square and uh, tools that we used to work from home. Those, those are going to be big. Um, and showing up to a restaurant and eating is not going to be so big. So we have to be smart about what we do. Um, and again, when we're playing golf, um, when it's time to go to a snack bar, and uh, we have to be careful what that snack bar is doing and, and make sure that they are, you know, on a given golf course, practicing social socialized distancing. So herd immunity is going to happen and we just have to let it happen. And it's going to be a race. Is it either going to be herd immunity or it's going to be, or is it going to be a vaccine that finally lets us declare this pandemic is over? We at least, we have at least a year to go. Okay, Meanwhile, thank you. we play golf safely. <laughs> Yeah. Right. And and one more related to the golf course specifically. Uh, the question is, should we be recommending to a foursome or group of golfers that they continue to wear their masks during the round? Or is it better to just maintain social distance while playing and then put the mask on when they're finished and are going to be in common areas like the pro shop, grill, snack bar, et cetera? You know, when you look, I, I think, I think, um, you know, the golf courses, to me, I, I think of them as shrines. And it's just so beautiful out there. And you've got the fairway and the green and the, you know, and I like the fact that we're not using a rake for a sand trap anymore. That's good because, you know, that, that can be a transmitter for the virus. But it's just so wide and vast as long as we're being smart and socially distancing. And uh, we have, you know, the cup, you know, for the ball, you know, approaching the hole, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera. I think we're doing really well with that. And I think we don't have to use our masks. Um, uh, but boy, after that ninth hole, when you, you're approaching, you're done. You've got to have that mask on. You've got to have that pearl soap all over your hands. And um, um, I think it's the, the fanfare of everyone uh, uh, gathering after the event is where we are at risk. During the event, hey, let the players play. I think they're safe. Hey, thank you. That's all the questions, Len. Okay, thanks, Nikki. So, Dr. Riley, one more, uh, which you alluded to, and that's uh -huh. contact services. You did mention that you're glad to not see the rakes in the bunkers. So, um, you know, the transmittal, the rakes, the flag right. sticks, touch flag sticks, and so right. on and so forth, sharing of equipment. Uh, sure. So, a little bit, so, as I said, you did, you did chip at it, so I'd love to hear a little bit more on the detail <laughs> of contact. I chipped at it, so to say. Well, it's just like being in a restaurant and you're passing your forks and knives and spoons in a lazy Susan back and forth. You know, let's try this one, let's try that. You know, that, you you are going to transmit the, the virus that way. You know, so so um, it's great that we're not, you know, we're not handing our golf clubs to the next person. No one's, no one, you know, five people aren't using your eight iron. You know, only you you are using your eight iron. Um, and we don't want a number of people using the same rake at a sand trap. Those things, you know, we don't want to touch things. Okay, we only touch our own equipment. Um, and that will serve to help, uh, you know, it's one of those things small, but, but an effective thing we can do to, to uh, curb the spread of the virus. Mm -hmm. Well, Dr. Riley, thank you. Again, the key points, the key takeaways, uh, certainly there are a number of them, but on a day-to-day, moment-to-moment basis, certainly our face coverings and respecting the social distancing 
seem to be our two greatest weapons. And then, as you mentioned, let's be smart out there. As Tom says, let's be responsible, particularly when we're in a high activity mode now, that we need to we need to be our own advocates here and make sure that we're looking out for ourselves, which in turn helps us to look out for each other. So, um, Absolutely. Dr. Thank you, you know, for, for everything that, that you're doing, uh, certainly on the front line all the way. And, and as I mentioned, uh, particularly for coming to us and joining us this morning after a 12 hour shift. So uh, oh, I hope that you. you so much. That's very you know. nice. I'm so glad to do it. This is so worthwhile. Uh, it's a great game, a great organization, and I'm, I'm happy to come back and give updates. Great. Thank you, uh, Dr. Riley. We will, we promise to take you up on that offer. <laughs> okay, very good. All right. And How I do hope you can stay uh, for the rest of our session, but totally understand you'd like to spend some time with your family, I'm sure. Sure. All right. Take care. Okay. So uh, next up will be uh, Craig Kessler, you know, our Director of Government Affairs for the Southern California Golf Association. And 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 Craig, certainly a lot has happened, as Tony Rice mentioned this morning uh, on our call. The legislature was due to come back this Monday, the 13th. That's been postponed uh, to now meet with the Senate return, which is on the 27th as there have been legislatures and staff members that have tested positive. So the Capitol, in essence, has gone into lockdown. That's also put a crunch on the bills that are there, uh, given the August 31, uh, as, as Tony called it, sign time uh, shutdown date. So uh, uh, many things, some of which we have a vested interest in our profession to get through this summer, but uh, it's, look, as he said, it's a mess. So uh, Craig? Yeah, uh, your updates, please, and thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Lynn. Good morning. And let me start with some issues that are not a mess. Um, I'm gonna. Uh, Dr. Riley said repeatedly something very specifically that Governor Newsom said last week, very, very generally. And before I get into some specifics, both of their comments should make everyone on this call pleased that as long as golf is responsible, safe, and as meticulous, and it continues to be as meticulous as for the most part it has been in following all the rules and ensuring that social distancing and common touch point practices are being followed, um, it should give us solace that unless things really get out of control, and we're all praying that doesn't happen, we should be able to play a form of recreational golf at minimum um, through this spike in the first phase of the pandemic. Uh, there will be a there will be a second wave. Um, how bad it will be, we don't know. I mean, Dr. Riley, you know, mentioned it a little bit, but he wasn't too specific, and, and I and I and I certainly took note of that. And what Dr. Riley said specifically was that. Golf was almost designed um, in, with, with COVID-19 in mind. That may seem like a strange statement, but he's correct. This game can be played in a way that it is safe, and it will be one of, as Governor Newsom said in his, in his big announcements last week, in which he closed down a number of things, and all of those things he indicated at multiple times in his speech all had something in common. They were indoor activities in enclosed places where it was pretty difficult. Um, with, first of all, when you're eating, you can't keep a mask on. Uh, and when you're drinking, yeah, you can put the mask up and down. But when people imbibe alcohol in enclosed places and that loosens them up, sometimes they, they, they forget about uh, COVID-19. In fact, indeed, one could argue that they went to the bar to drink alcohol in part to forget about some of the restrictions on our life that have been imposed upon us by COVID-19. And those things along with other indoor gatherings in which persons uh, came in very close quarters um, have, have, have probably are the reasons uh, for some of the spikes uh, is that way. So whether Dr. Riley, who is a great spokesperson for the game of golf, um, I'm sure you will be invited back and to be on this broadcast and others. But whether it was Governor Newsom making very clear last week that the that outdoor activities that that can be practiced safely are going to continue. We're not going back. 
to the sort of panic lockdown that we were faced with back in March as, as there was genuine fears about the public health system's capacity to deal with COVID-19 patients and all those other medical emergencies that, uh, that don't go away just because we're in a pandemic. That real, that real fear caused them to err on the side of simply shutting everything down. As Dr. Riley also said more than once in his, um, in his talk, uh, we, we know we cannot simply shut everything down between now and either a vaccine or the achievement of herd immunity. So golf should consider itself in good stead uh, for in that regard. Specifically, I know there have been some questions raised about San Diego County. And let me point out that any question dealing with any county, you must also pay attention if you're within a city uh, within the county, which is very, very common in Orange County, where some of the cities, Huntington Beach comes to mind, also Costa Mesa, which decided they wanted to be a little bit more specific with their enabling of recreational golf than their county was, which was very, very loose and not prescriptive at all. But even within San Diego County, while most of the cities are hewing to the county standards, uh, City of San Diego has some restrictions over and above that. But as a generic rule, I know many of you have noticed that if you go on the San Diego County website, you'll see that golf is just to follow the other state reopening protocols and orders, except there are two things of great specificity in addition there too. One of them deals with the single rider cart, uh, and that's because at the state level, uh, does permit double occupancy carts with proper uh, separation between the two sides, I guess plexiglass. Uh, but very few counties in the state have, have uh, not overridden that with something more specific in terms of single rider carts. And San Diego County would be among those counties that have overridden it. The second one is a little bit more problematic and probably concerns a lot of persons on this call who are listening in from San Diego County. And that goes to the fact that you're still uh, restricting lessons to uh, individual lessons one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And I think there's some history there and there's probably because of that history and because someone brought it to the attention of the uh, sections this morning, uh, maybe uh, Tom Addis and I will do what we did a few weeks ago in order to get to this point in San Diego County. For those of you with great memories know that when San Diego County reintroduced golf, lessons of any kind were strictly forbidden. And um, as other activities uh, were being reintroduced, golf, because it had been dealt with literally first, was sort of left uh, by the wayside because uh, public health uh, departments or public health officers are, uh, as Dr. Riley pointed out, there's nobody around who had experience with the Spanish flu, which was the last time we had a pandemic of this nature. So they arrived at, uh, at, at Mar in early March of this year. Also, even though they have great educations and they study the literature, and many of us have read a lot of that literature from a layman's point of view in recent weeks uh, to come up on this, and, but it's like anything. You don't really know whether or not the buildings you built to withstand a 9.0 uh, earthquake will actually withstand it until you test it in real life. God forbid we have to go through that. The same thing here. Um, so they're learning a lot of things. And so literally, they're, oh, I wanna, I'm, I'm sort of apologizing in advance to many of you who raised questions about some of these rules being woefully contradictory and inconsistent. Yes, they are, but they're that way not because, the, not because the public health officers don't understand that, it's because they are absolutely slammed and overwhelmed with trying to make decisions about that fine balance between commerce and public health, between safety and, and, and again, get, and getting back to a semblance of regular life and recognizing that a semblance of regular life also goes to the issue of safety. But where those lines are drawn, so what I'm trying to get at is they're faced with, with making decisions about public policy that are life and death decisions. And those of us in the golf industry, even government affairs directors, don't deal with life and death decisions. So I'm, I'm briefing a little bit to be a touch forgiving of these policymakers who are dealing with this for the first time. But in the case of San Diego and this very specific admonition for one-on-one for -on -one lessons only, that's because 
the Southern Cal PGA section and the SCGA had to go with a joint letter to the uh, public health officer in San Diego and to the County Board of Supervisors to indicate that they might, that it was perfectly safe to do group lessons under certain restrictions and if they were, and if they were simply to follow the prescriptions as they were written in Los Angeles County, which tends to be the most, most restrictive in the state, I, I know ever you read in the papers that the Bay Area is more restrictive, but our state's largest county has tended to actually follow follow that that lead. At least that's been my experience with golf. And of course, then San Diego adopted it. But precisely because it was a point of contention, and it was a point of contention that we raised, um, they have stuck with that because they because it, it rose to a level of importance from their point of view because of us that it probably didn't have. So Tom, I know, is listening. And so maybe after this, maybe this afternoon, you and I will get down to, to taking on that very specific issue. I know many of you are listening in from Los Angeles County and probably heard me a couple of weeks ago say that I felt that some considerable relaxations in that most strict of counties were on, we were on the cusp of those. And I think, and we were, I don't think there was any internal dissension, but again, remember my comments as these public health op departments are being slammed with these life and death decisions. And then they were faced shortly after I made those comments with a spike in cases and having to take on even more. So that's been delayed, not because I think there's any objection to those changes, which had to do with group play, group lessons, walk on play, practice putting greens and things like that, that I think that, um, that we're still expecting those and I say that with probably, without having to share details, having some, you know, I hope trust you understand, I have some more confidence. I think those things will be processed. And again, the fact that they're gonna be processed, approved and sanctioned at a time when, the, when those cases are going up is again, powerful, powerful support of what Dr. Riley said and of what Governor Newsom said about the continuing importance of safe outdoor activities, those things which are capable of practicing social distancing. And again, as Dr. Riley said, uh, and we, I think we should all remember his line, uh, although it's an odd one, that, that almost as if golf is, was, is almost perfectly suited for this particular pandemic. I say it's a little peculiar because it almost seems to be inviting the pandemic, but when you combine that with something that Dr. Riley might not be aware of, but everyone on this call is aware of, that we've all been a little bit surprised, pleasantly surprised, that since golf was reintroduced, and it began being reintroduced on a scale around April 20th, and came fully on board on May 8th, was the last county in Southern California anyway, to come fully on board, we understood there would be a honeymoon period when golf was first reintroduced, and that people would flood back out to golf courses in beautiful spring weather. But we're long past the honeymoon period, and at least the municipal systems that publish their results, and I track those pretty carefully, are showing remarkable increases year over year, June 2020 over June 19, 2019. And when you consider that, that June in Southern California, it has, there is no weather relation year over year. And when you add to that, that, that there are still large intervals, single rider carts, a lot of big busy systems run out of golf carts during the day, so, not, so there are some restrictions on play. When you, when you think of the, the pool noodles and all the other encumbrances that have gone on golf, the fact that it's gone up in popularity, I think is testament to two things. That peculiar, uh, that, that sort of peculiar, the fact that as Dr. Riley said, golf is almost peculiarly suited to this particular moment. That, and I hope it reminds everyone because everyone on this call is in the golf industry and has probably had the same reaction I've had to what I, I believe has been overly negative national media coverage of some of the problems the game has had in the last decade. Maybe we're just reminded that, um, that maybe golf has endured for 500 years through other pandemics, through wars, through depressions, through recessions, through all kinds of things all kinds of calamities, and yet it keeps coming back on top. And a lot of the things that it's been invidiously compared to in recent years have not endured recessions, uh, have not endured pandemics, have not gone through the thick and the thin. 
So let's always remember, maybe this moment is also testament to the fact that the game has enduring appeal and value. It may be a little difficult. It may take a little bit of time. Yes, those things have been true for 500 years, and I trust they'll be true 500 years from now. And let me boldly finish with a prediction that 500 years from now, we'll still be playing golf around the world. We may not be doing some of those other things that are supposedly trendier, and we're going to take our places within the, uh, you know, within person's, you know, appeal. So um, with that, I'd be, if I have raised any questions or caused any confusions, I would be happy to try to allay them. Very good. Checking with uh, Nikki for questions, but I'm going to change gears in the meantime, uh, back to something that's very close to us. And we started AB uh, 1850, which is the current iteration of AB5. And we had some momentum coming into 2020 in terms of the business develop the business uh, to business uh, relationship, and uh, it, it have pretty good sense now. I believe that not much will happen for the remainder of this year. Unfortunately, as mentioned, there's 700 bills that are on the floor right now, even though two thirds of them uh, might might find their way to uh, the to the pale. Quite honestly, the, still the, the legislature and the Senate only have 30 days to deal with these things. So your thoughts about if anything is going to happen with AB 1850 as we go forward? Yeah, I think everyone on this call, because they're golf professionals, understand that in the last session, we did what, what I'm calling obtain a, a healthy measure of relief for, P, for independent contracting PGA professionals through a business to business for professional services exemption that's written into AB5. We were set up going into this year, our number one legislative priority, Sacramento priority, was to use the organs of, a, 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 of Assembly Bill 1850, which was posted in essence to amend AB5 further. And we were going to be looking for, and we're still looking, we will still try for some tweaks in that language uh, that it's a 12 prong test and 10 of the progs are quite excellent. One of the prongs I think is okay. And one, we could use some changes in the language to go from a healthy measure of relief to what I would think would be a perfect measure of relief. But events have overtaken everything. And there is a member of the legislature in the hospital right now, others have tested positive. So they abruptly canceled everything we think they're coming back for a compressed four week period in which they're really not through with this year's budget. Keep in mind that we went from, uh, we went from a huge surplus to a bone crushing deficit in record time and they have to deal with that. And so, and probably deal with a couple of other things that are of an emergency nature. So I think we're coming to terms with, we are probably not going to be able to do that in 2020. But we will be able, I think, to hit the ground, be able to hit the ground running in 2021. Again, it's not that we won't continue to try. Uh, we will. It's just that I don't want to get anyone's hopes up that we will succeed. I hope we're pleasantly surprised by the opposite result. And I didn't mean to indicate in my conversation that focused exclusively on COVID-19 that there aren't other issues. Those of you who do get those SCGA governmental uh, affairs updates, and, and, I, and I know the Southern Cal PGA section forwards them to a lot of you, understand that, yes, there are some things on the ballot this November that affect the golf industry, not, not, not directly golf professionals as AB5 and AB 1850, 1850 do, but they do affect the golf industry. And any, if you work in the golf industry, anything that affects golf facilities, clubs, and, and, and that affects, affects you, no matter what role you, you play in it, um, so that deals with the uh, split role initiative uh, dealing with Prop 13 and, and, and property taxes. That's a complicated issue, and I'm not going to go into it now. And yes, there are things, uh, you know, uh, some and some pesticide issues and some regulatory issues that continue forward. And I guess as we sort of move into this long period, which I think if we play our cards right, safe and responsibly, and put continue to put on a good show for the world, I think golf can maintain. Um, during, uh, during these next six months, as Dr. Riley called them, which are going to be a difficult six months. But we are going to pivot. There are some other things that are going on you know, in, the, in the governmental universe um, um, beyond just those two issues, and we'll continue to address them. So I may have anticipated a couple of the other questions, Len, that you had on some other public policy issues. 
Uh, if I did, great. If I didn't, uh, fire away again. Uh, thank you, Craig. So though though we feel there be little, if any, advancement with a 1850, I think it's still prudent, and I hope you would agree that we continue to map out our strategy and talk to those that we can talk to who are influencing uh, the decision ultimately between now and and perhaps next year's session. So we still have work to do. Yes. Yeah, we have work to do, and I think maybe one of the things we can do uh, because we're going to be a little bit delayed is get a better sense of, uh, the, I mean, I, I know when this first broke, there were a lot of golf professionals who contacted me who thought they were not going to be able to continue, who turns out they were able to rework their agreements a little bit. Others, and again, I'm just going to, I'm just going to be blunt here and, and, and I hope I don't offend any of my management company friends, but the biggest problem has always been not the language of the business to business for professional services exemption because it provides a great deal of uh, protection. It's the reality that golf courses, public golf courses anyway, yes, there are some, uh, there, are, there, are, there are some, you know, some schools, there are some practice centers that are in this business, but we all, but, but most public golf courses are not really in the business of teaching golf. It's something that is done, and the way we've accomplished it in the business model most effectively for the facilities and for the golf professionals is through the independent contracting model because less than one half of 1% of the revenue from a traditional open to the public golf course is from lesson fees. Now, the 100% maybe of the income that a lot of persons on this call get come from that. And so what ends up happening when you sit down with your general counsel or a lawyer and says, so let me guess this. So there's, well, there's yeah, I think you're protected and there's not a whole lot of risk, but tell me how much money is at stake here? And the reality is when it's one half of 1%, the lawyer is gonna say, then why should you take even a one-tenth of 1% risk in pursuit thereof? Therein lies, the, therein has always lied the problem, uh, but we still need to seek the per perfect relief. So even those who take that attitude will be assuaged that they're not taking, they're taking 0% risk as moving forward. But I think if we can come up with some good examples uh, of those who do have reworked agreements so that they can continue as independent contractors, um, then uh, I think um, we'll, be, we'll be able to at least burnish that case with, those go uh, with golf professionals on a specific basis. Did I answer the question? Because I, I never know. <laughs> yes, thank you, Craig. Thank you. And and sometimes the answer is that at the moment there is no answer, but we have to stay the course. And given everything that's been happening in 2020, uh, that that seems to be what we're doing, and and it seems to be working. Again, we're grateful that Dr. Riley and Dr. Mattias and some of the others have, as you mentioned, Craig, complimented the golf industry for the steps that we we've taken, and quite honestly, the way that they are behaving, which is why we. Uh, encourage it and promote it so much. So, uh, uh, time time to wind down. Just a tremendous uh, session today, and uh, our thanks to Jeff Price, Chief Commercial Officer for the PGA of America. Of course, Dr. Thomas Riley. Dr. Riley, thank you again for joining us, uh, and your and your very valuable and important input. And Craig and Kevin and all the great work that's being done uh, in the Southern California Golf Association offices and keeping us in tune. So, at the moment, I'd like to. Uh, toss it to uh, Tom Addis. Tom, uh, thanks again for being such a great partner in this, and we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, Len, thanks. It's, uh, uh, these are really outstanding uh, opportunities for everybody, and I'd like to thank again uh, Jeff and, and Dr. Riley and Craig, of course. And We've been fortunate to have uh, medical staff, whether it be Dr. Riley, Mattias, or Dr. Landsberger, uh, share with us uh, the importance of, of going forward and living within um, the virus. Uh, and that's really, really helpful and, and stimulates us to uh, <laughs> act on our responsibility. And I think we need to continue to do that. But uh, thanks everybody for being here with us. Um, uh, next week promises to be another good one. Uh, we will continue to uh, provide opportunities to bring um, uh, medical staff with us, especially as this heightened awareness again and, and the spike, uh, I think it'll be very, very helpful. But thanks. And Len, thank you very much. And Dee Dee and Tony, and of course, Nikki, 
uh, and uh, and Bryce and Tyler and Caitlin and everybody said every week. But thanks again, and thanks to Craig and and Dr. Riley and and Jeff Price once again. So um, keep safe and be responsible and stay healthy. Uh, and uh, call if you need us. Thank you. Yeah. Again, uh, thank you, Tom. And uh, I'll ask our presidents, Dee Dee, Tony, any uh, any remarks as we head into the weekend, please. No, I'll just add, uh, stay the course, as everybody said, and, uh, you know, keep maintaining that social distance. And, and as long as we're following everything we need to follow at our clubs, it keeps golf off everyone's radar. Uh, so let's keep, keep, the activity, keep the activity going and keep us all working. And uh, I think that's the most important thing here. Thank you, Tony. Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, again, thank you for joining us on this uh, beautiful Friday morning in the state of California and Nevada. Again, please all, all be safe. Uh, be, as Tom mentioned, be responsible as we head out to our activities. We've been together, we've come a tremendously long way, and, and we're not going to let on our guard by any means. And we look forward to seeing you next week. Thank you. Thanks again.